Joining us now is Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Duke Comprehensive Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. Hello, Dr. Blackwell. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And sure. I just have to say, you look great. Thanks. Yeah. So do you. <laughs> All right. So, we have some interesting and important news to share based on your research, more news for our HER2 positive women. But first, maybe you could just do a little HER2 receptor brief explanation to help us understand what's the significance of targeting that HER2 receptor. HER2 is found in about one out of five breast cancers. And it's just a protein just like estrogen receptor, these things you hear a lot about in the course of figuring out what treatments patients need or how the treatments work. And it was discovered in 1986 that if two, uh, the one out of five tumors that have this, they're more aggressive, they grow faster, and patients who are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer have a higher likelihood of their cancer coming back if their tumor has this feature. Now, it's important to, to recognize that 80% of women diagnosed with breast cancer do not have overexpression or too much of this HER2 protein. And then throughout the past decade, we've realized that we can develop treatments that target HER2. And because the tumors need it so badly that if you, if you block it somehow, the tumors don't do as well. They're not as aggressive. And so when you look at the whole woman faced with a HER2-positive breast cancer, what we know is that their tumors are driven by HER2, and that we now have a number of treatment options available for these women faced with HER2-positive breast cancer. So, Dr. Blackwell, based on the results of, of your study of Tycurb and Herceptin combination therapy, you've suggested that the two drugs may be acting together to form a dual blockage, a, a kind of dual action to a obstruct the HER2 pathway. So let's elaborate on why this can be seen as a more complete anti-tumor attack. Yeah, so in the simplest of terms, trastuzumab is a, what we call a first-generation HER2 inhibitor. It's the penicillin for those of, for maybe not me, but for people old enough, you remember going to the doctor and getting the penicillin shot. We've improved on this. We found that we can take molecules and instead of just using an antibody, we can develop molecules that actually by themselves appear to work better than trastuzumab by itself. And that's because it's a very specific inhibitor of HER2. So we think of lapatinib almost as a second generation. So um, tetracycline or a, it's the Z-Pak. That's an equivalent that maybe people understand. So instead of having to go to the doctor and get a shot, you can go to the doctor and get z -Pak. So that's, lapatinib is considered a second generation HER2 inhibitor. They work different. And just like many times we combine antibiotics if someone's really sick, this idea of using one approach, the first generation, and then adding into it the second generation lapatinib was really highly attractive. And so because both drugs were, were available and well studied by themselves, there were a number of scientists that combined them and found in the laboratory they worked better. The other thing is that we noticed that compared to chemotherapy, trastuzumab and lapatinib don't really make people sick. Obviously, trastuzumab has a serious but rare, in my mind, rare side effect, which is cardiac damage. And lapatinib causes diarrhea, and sometimes that can be quite significant. And if, in a smaller number of patients, it can cause a rash. But all told, compared to chemotherapy, these drugs really don't have very many side effects, and they target the HER2 receptor differently. So the principle behind the trial was really, we have a second generation drug like lapatinib. Can it stand by itself? Or is it better to use both the first and gener second generation HER2 inhibitor, in this case, lapatinib and trastuzumab? We took women who really had progressed through all traditional options and had tumors that were driven by this HER2 protein. And what we, what we found was is that using both together, just like you would use two antibiotics, really allowed women to live significantly longer than using one approach or not. And in fact, the combination, and this, this number blows me away, 15 more out of 100 women were alive at a year because they got the combination. And I think for women that are faced with HER2 positive, metastatic breast cancer, because that's what this data really looked at, 
it really suggests that if your tumor needs HER2, you should really um, talk to your doctor about having the double approach. Yeah, understanding how few clinical studies really have shown mm -hmm. survival benefit in metastatic breast cancer, this is an outstanding number. I'm, I'm proud to be able to present it because we've been at a meeting where we've really um, unfortunately been able to improve outcome in women by weeks or months. And just the other morning I was thinking about it, just you know, coming to the meeting. I haven't ever faced breast cancer, but you know, I would want more, I would demand more than just a couple weeks improvement. And we need to do better. And this study I think is a small step to doing better. So basically the, the explanation of why this combination is so effective would be this analogy you made with the antibiotics. Mm. Yeah, and I think that really is, instead of taking one antibiotic for a sinus infection, you get two. And I think it also was a population of women who really had benefited from trastuzumab for a long time. These were women who had had up to six, seven prior therapies. And it really suggests that if you've, you've benefited from trastuzumab, mm -hmm. that that's what your tumor needs. And, and blocking it twice might be a, a better way of approaching the problem. And, and there's a secondary message here, because on one level, when a woman is told, well, you know, you're HER2 positive, yeah. the first thought may be a lot of fear. Yeah. And then immediately, we can look at women and say, ah, but you have options that other breast sure. cancer patients who do not have the HER2 overexpression are going to be able to. Yeah, I mean, people them. always want me to use the terms good and bad. And I have a tough time using those because it, it really is, we now know that if you, your tumor has too much HER2, it's overexpressing of HER2, then it, it's smarter but we also have a better kind of exactly. um, antibiotic about, uh, towards it. And it really is, this is not just throwing drugs that we think might kill dividing cells. This is taking the features of your tumor and getting the right drug to those patients. Personalized medicine. Yeah, it really is. So, all right, so this is, I don't exactly know where we are in the analysis as far as sure. what, what, where, where are we right now in terms of this, which is still a trial, mm -hmm. actually, if you had to project, yeah, a new standard of care. Well, I know my patients will be getting it when I go home, if in fact they've progressed on trastuzumab and have HER2 positive breast cancer. This combination is part of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines for patients whose um, treatment courses included trastuzumab, but whatever they're on isn't working any longer. Um, and then we also have worldwide studies of alto and neo-alto, and so this combination is actually being studied in women faced with early stage breast cancer as well. Our hopes are that the survival benefit we saw with women faced with metastatic breast cancer will be translated in, in reducing the chance of a woman's cancer coming back. But I think the message here is this, if a patient um, listening to this interview really ha is faced with HER2 positive breast cancer and in fact has had trastuzumab, then it certainly warrants a discussion with their physician about this idea of combining them given the highly large, highly, the large 4.5 month improvement in survival. Again, putting myself, and that's hard for me to do in the position of a, a metastatic breast cancer patient, I would want to be given the option of having a combination that allows for 15 more out of 100 women being alive at a year. That's a huge impact on the care of breast cancer patients. Because the large number of, of patients are treated in the private sector, mm -hmm. and this is a trial, a, a woman viewing this now thinking, you know, I'm newly diagnosed, yeah. I've been on my treatment with Herceptin for a while, I want to go back and talk to my medical oncologist. Yeah. If this is only available if they're enrolled in a trial? Yeah, so lapatinib is commercially available and it's approved in combination with capecitabine. That's a traditional mm -hmm. chemotherapy. It's an oral chemotherapy. And so the drugs, we do a lot of off-label use. In the, in, and what that means is we take a drug that's been proven maybe in combination with something else and we take that drug, and because the patient sitting, my patient sitting in front of me has benefited from, let's say, trastuzumab, 
And maybe they've even seen capecitabine or lapatinib. Both of these drugs are commercially available. And I don't think it's all that different than the way we practice oncology anywhere else. All of these studies, all of these approvals are really based on let's take thousands of women and see which drugs make an impact. We have to apply those to the patients sitting in front of us and I think the message which should be for a patient who wants to have a discussion about this with their, their physician that it's part of national guidelines in the United States, that both drugs are commercially available and that, you know, if I was to use the words of a, a breast cancer survivor, I would tell my physician I want to have that advantage. Fifteen more out of 100 women were alive at one year. We don't see that with anything we've ever done in a metastatic setting. So I think we all recognize, I'll go uh, on record as saying there's a real problem with the way we get highly effective drugs approved in, in all, all countries in the world. And because both drugs are commercially available and we have the safety of the combination, I think women should be encouraged to have a discussion with their physician to see whether this treatment might be an appropriate next step when they need it.